me the batteries. I didn't know at the time. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That meeting got every yeah. time he turned on the mic. Yeah. And he was he was holding and it he holds
All right, we'll call this agenda session to order. Um, we don't have to roll call, do we? Let's, so let's let's go ahead and jump right in here. Um, you'll see uh, on the agenda there the um, first uh, item of note will be Woodmore Elementary uh, Remembrance. Uh, so we will have that. Is that is that? That's what I was going to ask. That's the exact date, isn't it? Okay. All right. Yep, yep. And then we will have, um, uh, with our exemplars there, uh, recognition of Tennessee Principal of the Year. And I guess that's Dr. Leandria Ware. Is that right? Okay, so we'll have that. A good one. And then uh, moving down here into presentations. Um, so who, who's going to make that uh Dr. Johnson, who's going to make that recognition there of the state bill? Um, this the state bill, this. or the uh, or are you talking about the state principal of the year award? No, 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 right here. Uh, oh, Senator Guard Hire. Bill, yeah, Senator Guard Hire. He will, will be, be here. here. Correct. Okay. Yeah. He's actually going to make the presentation. I, I think more so than the presentation, it, it, he passed legislation last year around vaping, and it, it, it's obviously been a, a hot topic really across the state. Um, and so he's he's coming back one to I guess present a plaque to the district around um, that vaping legislation, but also to elevate that conversation so again. Probably, yeah, probably. Okay, and then we'll have a future ready update. Let's see here. Incomparable, Mr. Fulton. Yes, that's right. Hey, real quick, while, while, yeah, you're, yeah. while you're on that, uh, on future edit, but talk about tomorrow just a little bit, can you? Yeah. Uh, so we were notified um, Thursday, I want to say it was, uh, maybe Wednesday evening, that the U.S. Secretary of um of elementary and secondary schools might be coming to the district. Uh, and then we found out Thursday that they were coming. Uh, he was coming. Uh, and then we're instructed pretty quickly that the communication couldn't come from us. Uh, any communication would come from them if they wanted any communication. So I believe that you all received a direct invite um, and then um, today, actually, they uh, released a media advisement. And so um, basically, he's coming to see uh, the Future Ready Institute, uh, the partnership with UTC and um, Tyner. Um, he had had some interaction with um, UTC and, and heard about it, and UTC directed him to, um, to us. And so uh, look forward to him being, there, being here. Um, they've got a, a little bit of a schedule built. He'll have some roundtable time uh, after doing some visiting there at the school. Uh, and so, yeah, look forward to that. So yep. it's going to be 1130 at Tyner and then 130 at Ivy. Ivy Correct. So he's given a time. They've, they've given a, a, a time window between 1115, 1145, I think is the window they said to give time for travel or such. And so I think 1130 is the start, but it could be 10 minutes or later or earlier. So. They invited us also to Ivy. Correct. Yep. Yeah, that's one I'm going to try to make. Okay. So then, uh, so again, we'll have a, a future ready update there on great teachers and leaders for Mr. Fogelman. Um, and then uh, moving on down there to uh, under the consent agenda, field trips. So I don't know if you've had an opportunity to look over any of those. Um, there are some submitted there. Um, by Dr. Reynolds, I believe, and then I, also uh, I have by Dr. Question. Tharp. Yes, I had Ms. I Kathy. do. I have a question. Um, let me find it. I, there were two that I that there was one two from CSAS, one to Spain and one to Japan. That. Um, uh, Absolutely. Um, I just got off the phone with Scott uh, about this uh, 30, uh, 45 minutes ago, maybe, um, and um, had some uh, good dialogue around why um, we 
go through the process of approving these. And um, from a legal perspective, and I may let Mary speak to it um, even a little more in, in depth, but from a legal perspective, he just thought it's uh, – we're better positioned, you all as board and districts better positioned to um, to cover these uh, or to approve these or not to, to, to for them to go through the process uh, so that, um, you know, in, in the instance that something unfortunate happened, um, at least we've assured ourselves that we've made sure that these uh, trips follow our guidelines as far as um, um, uh, I'm saying monitors, but chaperones um, and the processes that we have in place and, the, and that we expect. I don't know, Mary, do you want to add anything to that or um, any additional legal guidance there? Um, I would say I would second everything you just said and that there is a precedent for um, uh, approving these kinds of trips. Uh, and that does it does fall within the corners of the applicable policy to do so. Um, and that, yeah, just to, to echo what Dr. Johnson said, that um, looking at it from a liability perspective um, and legally, um, the board is, we, it's our opinion, the board's in a better position liability-wise approving such trips than not approving such trips. And as Dr. Johnson said, otherwise um, not necessarily being in a position to dictate sort of the terms and the, and the safety and the security. And, and so that's, that's how we see it. Well, I'm no attorney, <laughs> but I will tell you, I think this look, opens it up for more liability. Why do we have to prove anything? These trips, one of them is June the 6th through the 20th, the one to Spain, and the one to Japan is June 18th through July the 2nd. They're not in school. I don't really care what the teacher or any student does on their own time. Um, and I think this, if something happens to one of these students on one of these trips, they're going to say, well, the school board approved it. Uh, I think that opens us up for a whole lot more liability than if we just say, hey, that's on their own time, that's their own deal. If they want to go out of the country with somebody else, that's up to the parents and and uh, the students and, and the, their, whoever they went with. I just think it opens us up for a whole lot more liability than if we just say that's in the summer, they're not in school, and we really don't have anything to do any more than we would approve a trip for them to go to Florida. I mean, you know. Uh, because I tell you what, one of these days something's going to happen to somebody on one of these trips. Uh, uh, somebody's, uh, you know, somebody's going to get assaulted. Somebody's going to—I mean, people get killed, you know, all the time doing out of, out of the country like this. So I just—I'm beginning to wonder if it's not going to open us up for more liability. And that's something that obviously can't be known, and we hope nothing ever happens to anyone. I, I, I certainly uh, recognize the, the possibility, um, and. Yes, these, these are during the summer, um, but again, I, th I think, you know, and certainly the board doesn't have to approve it, but um, there is precedent for it, um, and such trips have been approved in the past, and, and um, approval does fall squarely within the policy, and, uh, and so that would just be what I, what I would hearken back to. Good question. Yeah, Dr. Hollander. Uh, Mary, help, help me here. Would we be more liable if we did not approve, or would we be under less liability? It's it, that is a question that that is impossible to answer with certainty right now. But um, as Dr. Johnson said, uh, approving it gives then gives the board more um, control on right. the front end over the parameters and um, over the logistics and therefore puts the board, I think, in a better position to control um, just the sort of the terms of how it goes over there to the extent any control can be exercised. Um, I think it puts the board in a better position of control to approve. Well, I, I realize, like, for instance, drinking age is quite different abroad than it is here. Yes. And we can say neither, neither the teachers nor the students can be drinking on the trip, alcohol, alcoholic beverages on the trip. You know, I, I, I mean, I understand that, but yet if something did happen, I see Ms. Thurman's point too, if something did happen and we approved it, you know, then I, it, it's... Uh, that's what parents are for. If their parents, if their parents want them to go to Japan and to Spain in the summer, let them go. That's a parents thing. I don't. If they if they get caught drinking at eighteen, that's their parents' uh, problem or yeah. their parents' problem. It's not ours. I don't know. I don't know why this is our problem. Yeah. It's a parent problem. I don't care what anybody's kids do in the summer. That's up to their parents. Yeah. I mean, we are not parents for these kids. I'm sorry, Mary. Who, um, 
so to the extent that you know uh, about this, so who initiates, you know, so like at Chattanooga State, um, students have the opportunity to go abroad in the summer semester, but it, it's it's initiated by the state of Tennessee, and obviously we're talking about students that are above age 18, but mm -hmm. it's initiated by, um, uh, by TBR, uh, Board of Regents, uh, Travel with Tensis. I mean, they advertise it all the time, but obviously, I mean, this is an outside, I know there are plenty of travel agencies that are geared around educational trips, but so when, when an arts and sciences or another school lines a trip up, so, so who initiates the trip, um, for lack of a better term, whose idea is the trip? Um, I know we've done it in the past, but so let's say, is it, hey, it's the, it's the social studies department at, at arts and sciences who say, you know, we're, we're going to, you know, we'd, we'd like to, to, to broaden the horizons here and not just talk about Roman culture out of a text, but we're going to go over there. You know what I mean? So, like, I guess that's my thing is who, who initiates it and how does that whole thing start? And I actually don't know with regard to these specific trips who initiated it. Um, I, I thought it was – the assumption was it was initiated somewhere in the classroom or, or something like that. That would, be, that would be my assumption. Yeah. I don't know that for a fact. Okay, so my second question would be – um, and to Ms. Thurman's point that, you know, hey, if parents want them to go on a trip, then go on a trip. If what what where is the liability? Where is our liability if um, information for a trip is made available to students, um, but is not necessarily promoted by the school, the school system? I mean, I guess that's where I'm going with that. Like, where where's the fine line there? Because. I'm sure there are plenty of parents, I mean, that would, you know, I'm not sure I'm one of them, but there might be plenty of parents that go, hey, I'd love for my 17-year-old to go, you know, Spain for <laughs> five days, 10 days, whatever. If, I guess what I'm saying is by letting these these companies advertise for a trip, are we now, when you talk about having control on the front end, did we now just give up our control on the front end just by simply letting them advertise for the trip? Does that make sense? It does. Um, I don't know that it, it, it's – I don't think it's a matter of giving up control on the front end, but there is already this sort of assumed relationship between the school and the trip, I think, just because of the, the initiation of it at the school level. Yeah. Um, however that came about. Yeah. Um, and um, and that's where, again, we go to, you know, um, if there if there's approval, there's a, a greater level of control for the board. So how does it and again, I, I'm not trying to deny anybody an opportunity to do anything. How does the how does the student or their family have access to this? Excluding the school system. Does that make sense? So how are they able to, you know? How would they otherwise be able to go? Correct. Uh, and I don't know. I, that's that's a good question. I don't know that they would, you know, or I, I don't know how that would. Um, I, I, I don't know how, th how they otherwise would um, know about it or be able to engage in it. I don't know if Dr. Johnson. No, I don't know. And I, and I asked, and to, so just for point of clarity, um, I asked Scott specifically about these um, because uh, they are unique um, for two reasons. One, they're out of country, you know, and I don't think that part of it's necessarily. I won't say that part's unique to the to the district because I know that's happened for years and years and years. But they are unique in the context of field trips because most of our field trips, most of them, frankly, are in state. Um, there are some competition based that are out of state, performance based that are out of state. So that's part A of why it was unique. The second part of why it's unique is because it's outside of our, it's, you know, the dope piece is outside of our school calendar, and so. You know the the lining the line of questions that I pose to Scott is is this something that we should be engaged in the in the approval of? Um, I asked the question about the third party, so to speak, vendor that's the facilitator of the trip and the teacher, because then both these are teachers, I believe, that are. Um, kind of the sponsors or the leads on the trip they're working through are they working through a third party vendor um, does that third party vendor assume responsibility and if the third party vendor assumes responsibility then are we inserting ourselves into um, 
you know, uh, into that into that place. And furthermore, um, you know, and, and, I, and I think I, I would and, and I need to understand um, and I will have to understand about Thursday. This may be an item that we ask for to be pulled um, so that we can get more legal context on it as well because I would have the question if the third party vendor um, it seems to me that from a legal standpoint maybe for protection of the board that we we implore that third party vendor to include some type of clause that absolves the school district of responsibility you know um, for it and so you know they should they should be you know they're facilitating the the trip and so um, that's just a question I have now well then we, we want our kids we want students to be exposed like these exposures are great and I know everybody on the board is fully supportive of it but I do think we want to be thoughtful with liability in particular in the world that we live in um, right now with the level of responsibility that could come up upon the system so um, if the board would allow us to dig into these couple of trips a little bit more um, they didn't even have to be asked Tucker witnessed the call um, they didn't have to be asked they're flagged here uh, we want to dig in a little bit to see if there's not a better way for us to work through um, these trips. Um, and, and again, we don't want to keep students from having access to these trips, but we also want to understand from a liability standpoint how we best protect the system uh, going forward. Okay. Any, Dr. Holland, did you have Ms. something? Smith, Dr. Smith has one I got to Go comment too. I think Ms. Lennon does too. Right, yeah, I agree with what's already been said. I, you know, uh, I, I can remember not too terribly long ago, uh, my my son, when he was growing up and didn't go to public school, went to private school, but they had a trip in Japan, and we just couldn't afford it. I mean, we just couldn't afford it. And uh, I remember how difficult that was for him. So my biggest concern, I mean, I'm worried about the liability, too. And I think about that little girl that I don't remember her name, that I think it was Aruba or whatever it was that got kidnapped and killed. And, and uh, you know, uh, that could happen. Man, I, we live in a dangerous world. I'm telling you. So I worry about that. But, but more importantly, man, these, so many kids get left out of stuff like this just simply because... Uh, they can't go. Well, they don't have the money to go. Three years ago, my twin granddaughters had a trip to Washington, D.C., uh, fifth grade, or I think, maybe fifth, sixth grade, I don't remember. But anyway, his mom, their mom and dad, they couldn't pay for both of them to go, so they had to come to Pops. You know? <laughs> and that, a lot of these kids don't have a Pops. Right. So I, I'm more concerned about that than I guess as I am about the liabilities. These kids that would love to go when everybody's excited and talking about it, but I don't get to go because my daddy ain't got no money. So I worry about that more than anything. That's just a comment. Uh, <coughs> quite a few years ago, my two daughters went with one of the services, and I had to sign a contract. And at that time, I remember uh, Mary and Scott probably know I try to read contracts fairly thoroughly. And my father-in-law was living at the time. He read it. He, hmm, I wouldn't sign this. And it pretty much absolved the teacher and the service and said, it's on you, parents. Yeah. And, you know, I thought at the time, I think if we do this, I would like for Scott and or Mary to look over the contract with a fine tooth comb and see well, how the contract relates to responsibility. And, and I mean, this is many years ago, but the, but I've been offered a chance to go. And I thought, I don't want the responsibility of taking those kids out of country. This myself when I was a teacher. And I thought, man, I'd love to do that. The general, the premise of the idea is the, the lead teacher gets to go free. And for ever how many, ever how many kids go, the spouse, significant other, or other teachers get to go either reduced price or free, and that's that's their payment. They get that's the kids pay enough to cover for their sponsors. Which is I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I just know when I when I read that contract many years ago, I thought, wow, this is putting all the responsibility back on me. And it was someone, and it was not nearly as dangerous a world 20 years ago as it is now, but. But I, I would hope that Mary and Scott would look over the specific contracts with those two vendors very closely. Does that make sense, Dr. Johnson? Absolutely. Then those are some of my same questions. Um, 
the cost because I think that you know when you look at the one for um, Spain the <coughs> There's no, there would have been no way my child could have gone on either one of the trips, and I don't think that um, that's equitable for all children. Um, and the other thing that I have a question about is I think that we have to just be very mindful of the um, the insurance part of the of the people that are driving on the you know the bus drivers the um, when the children get over there uh, the when driving is the driver staying with them you know the, these companies are we paying for the drivers food and lodging as well is that something that we're having to do um, what kind of rating does you know we're so very concerned you know we've upped our expectation of the drivers that we have here for our students um, so what is what is our expectations of our of our drivers when our you know when they're on a trip like that um, and what company are we using you know I kind of you know we just l are looking at this one little sheet so I know we don't see all of the information so I think that we need a lot more information and and I do I think that it's it when students are taking a trip in the summer I is that something that that we have to approve I, I, I still have a problem with that I just don't is that a school trip I think all very very fair questions um, questions that are rolling in um, in my mind um, as we weigh the responsibility uh, of it so um, we will we will get additional information on these couple items yeah, we'll get really, more information really to be a a really Debbie Downer here, but you know we're not supposed to go on any trips that all kids don't go on. So I'm wondering how this kind of fits into that, uh, like a field trip, if it's for educational opportunities and all this kind of stuff. You're not supposed to be able to take certain kids without others if it's for an educational experience. Of course, this is not during a school day, which, ask me again, why is this any of our business where people's kids go in the summer? That's up to their parents. Okay, do we um, do we see anything else there under field trips that uh, we need discussion on or answers to? Those or the ones submitted by Dr. Tharp. All right, then that moves us on down to uh, bids and contracts. Um, do we have anything there? Ms. Thurman? Yes, I do. Uh, 1C textbooks, world language, 1,324,000, and then 1E voices in concert, $176,000. Uh, just received a, um, a, a note from a teacher. Um, it says, a question a lot of teachers have, and I know there are a lot going on in Hamilton County, is why do we spend hundreds of millions, hundreds of thousands of dollars for new book adoptions and then tell teachers we do not want to use those basal readers in the cl classroom? The new bath, books, new bath books do not cover our standards, so we don't use them or just do a few pages. Many of these big, beautiful basal readers stayed, stay in work closets or in other rooms until they are donated to La Follette, uh, La I guess. So, yeah. Okay, some uh, schools send them off before the adoption was even over because they got in trouble for using them. Said, I'm so sick and tired of seeing us waste money, and this is from a group of teachers that sent me that. So, you know, I guess I just want to make sure, because the textbooks being so expensive, just really, yeah. I'll be glad when they all go out of business and we can do everything online myself, <laughs> but, because it's ridiculous to charge for textbooks. But I just want to be sure that the textbooks that we're getting, that we're using, yeah. Because this group of teachers got together and they made a list of books that they have that they're not allowed to use that are brand new books. And so if uh, I just want to be sure that we're using them. If we're not using them, what's the point? Absolutely. So we, we haven't uh, – the math adoption, we haven't really adopted a math um, specific text um, as far as a, a – um, hard copy text um, in, in some time. Um, obviously, you know, this year we're doing um, two pilots of reading language arts, uh, and so there'll be an adoption for that anticipated in the spring. Um, and actually, probably next month uh, th that committee will come before you for approval. Um, so with, with world languages and um, and choral music, um, I think to the point earlier uh, that you were making, uh, one of the things we found is there's no, there's not a single textbook that purely aligns to the state standards. That's just the, that's just the reality. And, and as soon as you find a textbook that 
aligns 80 percent or better they change the standards, they change the standards yeah. and then you're misaligned and you all know the cost of textbook adoption so you're always chasing your tail with textbook adoptions um and that's just the reality and then when they change the standards that textbook becomes obsolete and then it does go to the show so online is the way to go and that's the way we've been going the issue is in these types of areas in particular core music and arts um the companies just aren't quite there yet uh what they've done is uh you know and and and, and frankly, for our, our system, I want to say it's been 15 or 16 years. Um, we went back and dug into it since we actually made a purchase um, around, uh, you know, music or um, or world language. You may want to speak to it. We can hear you. Just Tom. Uh, yeah, I'll let like Keith figure that out. I know for world language, we haven't purchased any world language textbooks in um, at least 12 years. And the, the choral uh, adoption was several years ago, and we, we're just now purchasing from that adoption. And the other thing, this, these two areas came up, frankly, they came up from teachers um, and the reason why they're on the, the, the reason why they're here and we asked because we asked some questions when we went out and as we've been going out talking to teachers, these two areas are areas that will come up from teachers as they say, hey, look, we don't have a resource here and we see that, you know, you're focused on math and reading and that's all well and good, but we're, we feel kind of left out. And so we, as we went back and dug in, we kind of saw well, hey, um, there hasn't really been an investment for protecting in those areas in some time. But, you know, I think to your point, Ron, we're really trying to look at how you blend the tech, the technology and the textbook budgets and trying to be more methodical with our purchases and trying to make sure that whatever we purchase is going to be maximized. So I, I think um, historically speaking, just knowing it from um, previous roles, uh, you know, you, you adopt and then the standards change and then you adopt and the standards change again. So, um we, we feel good about these purchases in particular because there's less standard movement in these particular areas uh, and and they just have not had a resource in those areas. Mr. McLennan. Um, sorry, Internet's not let me pull up my notes. The copier contract. Can you just walk us through what that does? Um, does it work now? I can't pull. I can't pull up the contract or my notes on it. So, uh, she'll just kind of walk me through that. Yep. So currently, we have somewhere over 300 copier contracts throughout the district between all the schools, central office departments. Uh, as an example, one school may have seven con seven copiers, and each copier is on its own individual contract. So this would consolidate all copy machine, multifunction copy machine contracts into one centralized contract for the school district, district-wide. We'll get one invoice a month processed through the central office. And um, so currently what we do is we, some of the, the money we allocate to schools, a big portion of that is used to pay for the copy machine. So we would, you know, rebalance all of that. So all we're doing now is we're writing a check here and they're writing a check there. So we would cut that step out. There'd be less um, paper push just to pay for the copiers. And then we're also going to be able to realize um, savings of at least $150,000 is our current estimation um, from what we pay in total currently to what we would pay under the new contract. We think it will be more than that once the vendor comes in and does a needs assessment throughout the district. We know that we have some schools that probably have too many copy machines. Um, we have some that may have older machines so they're less efficient. Their production value is not as good, um, those types of things. So overall, we know that we're going to realize savings. Estimated 150,000, it could grow. Um, we, our schools alone, currently spend about 730, 740,000 a year on on copy machines. Um, is it going to? Are we still going to limit the number of copies a teacher gets in a year? I've had, I've, I've seen just on social media teachers like hey anyone have a printer or a copier i can use um and i, I think so if we're gonna we, we've talked about this in our implementation meetings and to start with we're gonna wait until we're gonna keep everything the same um and on it's on a school by school basis now <laughs> principal. that's driven by the fact that they're having to use a big chunk of their resources that we give them to pay for copiers um, so we're going to let it stay the way it is for a few months until Beeler is actually able to complete the needs assessment throughout the entire district, and then we can take a look at that. 
um, Beeler has some ideas. You know, they've done business with the school system for 50 years and and provide a very high level of service. That, um, all their representatives are known by the school employees. They're, they're in schools constantly. So they, they've got a lot of analytics they can provide us that can help us with that. What we think will happen is if we if we tell everybody they can make as many copies as they want, um, that the cost is going to increase pretty dramatically in the short term, then it would level out. So I think if we take a more methodical approach to how we tackle that, probably put some caps, maybe higher than what they have now. Some schools are high, some are low. So we need to kind of get to a standardized place um, and then adjust for schools that don't use books. For example, CSAS is one that, that makes a lot of copies. Um, and some of the other schools that, that focus more on <coughs> textbooks. So we will adjust based on those factors, but otherwise we need to kind of create a standard based on the needs assessment. And then the other issue is we have to make sure we have good policies and procedures in place for um, personal use of the machines. One thing that the, the codes do now is they prevent a lot of personal copying, which when you have 78 schools and 300 copy machines, that can add up to quite a bit of money if there's not some mechanism in place to, to deter it. How many vendors will you? How many vendors you need? Currently, um, so currently Beeler has contracts in about 84% of our schools. Um, and they have a very high service level. They rated the highest one when the RFP was scored. We also have three additional vendors that provide services throughout the schools and central office. So we would go from four vendors to one. So 84%, uh, so a, a dollar figure. Where, how much are we spending with, with them? Um, it, so if we're spending close to a million dollars, that'd be about... Eight hundred forty thousand. Okay. So, what kind of annual donation are they making back to the school system? Well, so we know we'll save one hundred fifty thousand. So, that wasn't what, a question. One, what what kind of what kind of donation is that vendor making back to the schools? I mean, it sounds kind of crazy, but I, I mean, I do that all the time. I mean, people that I'm spending a lot of money with, then you know, there's a period of time every year I go to them and say look <laughs> I'm a good customer uh, help me here I, I would leave that up to the board because we're not allowed to uh, okay. ask for donations in a do we have a uh, that sounds like a quid pro quo to me <laughs> <laughs> do we have a uh, uh, <laughs> that's why I put that back on the board. are you saying we need a benevolence no, liaison no what I'm uh, saying uh, is, Smith, is that no what I'm saying <laughs> you know, know what, what I'm about. saying I think I think <laughs> Yes, yes. So if we have a, do we have a financial development person? <laughs> yeah, we, we will engage um, our, our um, community engagement in the, in that conversation. I think um, we, we found, and it's not necessarily just even vendor based. Um, the easiest people to use are, is the teachers, the credit union here, um, Chattanooga um, Area Schools Credit Union. I mean, they are constantly giving right. to. I mean, they they pay for. They're not a vendor. They, but they're not a vendor, right? And so, in, I use them as an example, just to say, they are somebody that you know that sees a, a, a great return on what they invest in our school system because so many of our educators do bank with them, um, and we don't, you know, we don't make anybody bank with them choose who you want to bank with, but they do see a lot of uh, returns. So absolutely, I think as you look at opportunities, um, it, we, we think vendors would, would want to uh, be a part, be a part of a relationship with us. And Probably nobody's so, ever asked them. Well, to be clear, I'm never asking any vendors for yeah. any well, money. Listen, no, say that one more time, <laughs> one more time. Never for asking record. vendors for money. That, I mean, that's not inappropriate at all, especially if we have a financial development person whose job it is to raise money for the. Well, so I'll just just to be clear, state law and board policy prohibits any sort of kickbacks from vendors, and that could be considered a kickback by the state comptroller's ask office. Them to sponsor something for district, maybe. Okay, Dr. Highlander, you got, you got to be you're right. in a gray area there legally. Dr. No, I'm I am outside the gray. I'm not asking them for anyone. <laughs> Yeah, you don't want to be in. Uh, well, I won't, I won't even go there. But Rhonda made a good comment. Uh, 
I've got a question. Uh, I, I will say this, commenting on that. My wife, before she retired, and her teaching partner would look at their quota of paper at the end of the school year every year. They would go in and use every single sheet they were allotted for that year so they would have enough to start the next year. And, and that was, I thought that was, they were pretty wise. They would just even after school was out, if they had any numbers left that they were allowed, they would, have, they would be ready for the first two, three, four weeks of school, which is what wise teachers do. A lot of them let it go back in the bank, they lose it, and then they, but I, I had a question about that. And, and once again, I'm like, uh, Mr. Wingate, I don't have my computer here and I can't get this one to do what I want, but uh, uh, I, I was reading over, over the weekend in my illness and I read about the I-ready language in math that Stephanie Hinton uh, asked for $250,000. Is that last month or is that this month in request in the bids? The I ready. I just had a question about that. Now, I mean, I ready supposed to be good. I'm not. That's already been in board approved. That's already been board approved. Well, I've got a question about what we approved there. I, I, looking back and reading it, uh, we we and I thought it was last month, and I thought we had approved it. That's my understanding. But when I started looking over it more thoroughly, we two of the schools that we approved were charter schools. And and I understand that we are we have some responsibility for them, but academically, correct me if I'm wrong. The the money follows the child, and they get the same amount of academic money, but we don't get the money for academics that they get. So they should be responsible for that, should they not? I I, I mean, do you understand what I'm saying, Dr. Johnson? And now maybe I, am I misreading this? Well, one one thing I would say is there was not an additional cost to allow the charter schools to use. We so I think that was just more in the in the, um, in the vein of partnership with our charter. Okay, right. and, and, and I'm not. I mean, and, and I, a lot of them are doing a good job, and, and I'm not demeaning them at all. But I'm saying if we had a choice to do two charter schools or two of our the ones that we have ultimate responsibility for, I would think that we would want to spend it for them, not rather than for the charter schools. Well, we we actually brought this up whenever we did approve this originally. I missed that somehow. It was probably six months. I mean, it was a while ago. It was <coughs> certainly prior to when I to when Chris and I were out, and um, I believe I asked that same question, and it was stated that it's it's a there's no cost, and so therefore the charter schools can opt in, and there's you know there's no. There's no penalty to us to do that, and I mean, and technically, they are one of our schools, so um, I believe that was the response. You're saying it doesn't detract from the other schools? Yeah, that thank you. That's exactly so, what I'm I mean, trying to we say. We had an unlimited right. number of schools that we could put on that contract with ready? No, not necessarily. So we, so if you if you all recall, we did all of our middle schools uh, gave all of them access this past year, Chrissy Easterly. Um, brought up the fact that from a um, from an adaptive resource uh, standpoint and when I when I say adaptive I mean one that meets a student's need exactly where they are um, that principals felt good about our ready at the middle school level so we we open up that access to everybody when the opportunity zone want to go with a deeper investment um, it didn't cost them any more to offer it to um, the charter school obviously for us um, you know we're not going to put ourselves in a position where we're um, where we're taking resources that could be advantageous to other schools to, you know, go the other way. At the same time, we we try to be um, thoughtful partners with sure. our with, I, I with mean, the charter schools. So we we open up our doors for um, for principal trainings, assistant principal trainings. Um, you know, they can opt into any of those types of things. Uh, we we've given them the option to uh, to you know leverage some of our resourcing in regards to uh, fairs. Choice fairs and such that we'll have, um, but again, nothing at, at, at cost, at the cost or at the expense of other schools, and um, and so that's just. I, I mean, I, I agree with being a partner with them as long as it costs us nothing. But I thought if there was a limited number of schools that I already was available for, I you know when I looked over that and I did not remember that discussion, but I uh, and certainly if it's no cost, but yet if we have a limited number, I would rather the schools that we have the ultimate responsibility for be taken care of first. And, and but I, I certainly. Certainly, uh, their scores count for us, and I, and I want us to be cooperative with them. I think that was the big part of the competition was that, well, their scores count for us, so we only benefit if they do well on this technology, but yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> that takes us down to...
Um, we've got financial reports there and budget amendments. Any questions about uh, either of those under business? I have I have a question if no one else does about uh, just the the principal incentive. I don't know if that's for um, Mr. Fogelman or Mr. Goldberg. So is that a retention incentive? Is that what that is, or is that a uh, okay? Yeah, it is, and I believe we. You want to you want you want to talk about? It? I can talk about. It. You want to talk about? It? You want me to talk about? It? Talk about? It. All right. Um, I believe what we talked about. And we went back and forth on this. Um, the board had already approved several of these, and this was an addition um, that was added. So we were trying to figure out as to whether or not this had to come back. We just brought it back as a as an additional individual item, but it is a retention um, incentive through state priority funds to uh, try to retain leaders and teachers um, within the uh, within the opportunity zone within the priority schools specifically. Right, uh, Mrs. Robinson. Sorry, just real quick. I I was reading it as you were talking, so I probably missed what you said. Uh, it's not based on any scores or anything like that. It's just it's not performance. I'm sorry. Yeah. Is it is it performance based? I'm sorry. No, the state didn't. It's not driven by performance. It's driven by um, retention from the state um, from the from the approval standpoint. The, the schools are identified by the state, and oh. the state provides a retention bonus for principals in those schools. Why does what? How does the state decide which schools? Because they're state priority schools. Well, no, I understand that. Um, I'm sorry. I think I'm a little confused. Okay, sorry. Um, so I'm looking at the list, and it's not very long. We have more schools in the priority and in the opportunity zone than what's on this list. Yeah, you got. So is it only for principals that have been there from year after year? You know, so you got two different things. The opportunity zone is not all encompassing of priority schools, and okay. so um, or vice versa. The priority school, every school in the opportunity zone is not a priority school. And so that's why. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. Yes. I've forgotten that we have like but, the lower But what you've got with okay. opportunity zone is you've got those two feeder patterns and you try to wrap around okay. all the feeder patterns. But this is strictly an incentive to. Um, a priority school. But for to get principals to stay, basically, Correct. right? Okay. Correct. All right. Okay. Anything else there under, um, under business? Sorry, one question. Okay, is the state incentivizing principals that have high performance in these schools as well? Like, not this, but is there a separate funding program that the state is doing to incentivize them whenever there's, like, high performance in these schools? No, I, I think that's a um, – I think it's a – it's a conversation that you could see coming up going forward. Um, we've not had that from the state um, as of yet. And I think much of that is driven by um, – how you define high performance and okay. how controversial it mm -hmm. it becomes um, and probably out of the way. Yeah. 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 Okay. And so uh, the state's kind of the state's the state's kind of stepped away from that element in regards to um, okay. determinate distribution of funds. Okay. But. Thanks. Joe, what about may I ask about the uh, Tyler Technologies? Sure. Can somebody explain to me exactly? I mean, this first paragraph is like like a run on sentence. It just in the addition to traditional finance nation of the new enterprise resource planning tool also blah 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 blah. Can someone explain to me exactly what that does? So we currently use a product offered by SunGuard K12 uh, that's called Business Plus. It used to be called IFAS. We started using that software 16 years ago. It runs all of finance and HR. So all of our accounting, purchasing, budgeting, everything, um, as well as the HR functions, payroll functions, those types of things. Um, so this is to replace that with a new modernized ERP system called Munis, which is uh, developed by Tyler Technologies. Um, it's used by Montgomery County, Williamson County, Wilson County, um, I think rather uh, Knox County um, in Tennessee, as well as all over the country. They're, I would say they're the largest provider of ERP systems for K-12. And we, we did references and, and everything else, and they 
we made the choice was made that this was the best option for us to meet our needs. So one thing that they, the last part of that first paragraph is that they do have open government uh, modules within their software um, that will allow us to have open finance, you know, have our checkbook online in real time, um, budget, interactive budget, real time financials, those types of things, um, because that's just the way you know the government world is going right now. So that's an option on the, in the software that we don't currently have. And, and what we have so this would but this is not just for that it's just an, it's an extra uh, option that we would it's not extra it's included in the software so this is really to replace our our primary uh, enterprise software that we have currently okay so this will do it because I we've had discussions before about putting the uh, checkbook online and we said we didn't have the capability to do that but this so, will so right that. now I mean the only thing we can do is, is post a spreadsheet on our website and it's not in real time it's pretty you know it gets outdated yes. and it's a manual process this would just do it automatically it would be a link that it would be a link between our back-end software and our website that just constantly updates um, budget information, financial reports, checkbook, whatever we want to open up. And just one point of clarification is the um that you might want to give is just the timeline of transition yeah. from oh, yeah. you know if, if this is approved it's not a that you you'd be up and running right. in January There's so yeah and, and I'll, I'll tell I I'll mentioned too one of our primary reasons for doing this now is we we are losing confidence that we will be able to continue processing payroll with the current system we have in an accurate and timely manner it's a very manual process it takes 14 hours uh, once we press a button to process a payroll and with a new software where it'll take about 20 minutes. So oh. it's a the, the database architecture that we have in place currently is just outdated, and um, this is just this is built for school systems and handle all the payroll calendars, all those types of things. The implementation, if this gets approved uh, Thursday, then we can kick off implementation work with the vendor. We would go ahead and start having meetings and develop an entire project management schedule. The go live date would be one one twenty one. So we have a, we'd have a thirteen month runway to go live. Um, the data conversion uh, only takes, you know, they can do that in a couple of weeks. They've converted a lot of uh, Business Plus customers. The, the primary reason for that long ramp is training. So they, they have a very robust training program, and it's not train the trainer. It's everyone's going to be pretty immersed. I mean, there is some train the trainer, but there's also some, some immersion. And, and on January 1st, we would switch over and go with the new software. And they'll have people on site to, to run you know, critical tasks like payroll and those types of things, but we will have already run several payrolls through the test environment before we get to that point, make sure everything matches. So uh, this is a 13 month lead time to go live and the funds are already uh, set aside in the technology, assigned for technology in the fund balance. Just just one other point I'd make, just, um, I, I, there are a lot of folks that make the school system go, you know, um, and so when you got 6,000 folks that are working every single day, one of those very small, uh, can be easily missed groups that become um, really known if something goes wrong is payroll. And our payroll folks do a phenomenal job. Um, there's been multiple times where they're working hours, you know, just working extended time to get things done. Um, um, and you all just know if you read across the state in the country that you know um, when there's an issue, uh, it, it there's an issue, and so they, they do do a great job with what we've had uh, in the system, and and, and 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 such, and so much so that the 13 month runway gives us time to make sure that everything is stood up and because the last thing we want to do is miss a miss a pay period um, at all, Lordy. Uh, so it makes me scared, but it is the right way to go for efficiency sake. Um, and, to, and to make us, uh, to ultimately get us a place of more transparency as well. Dr. Highlander. Uh, a couple of quick questions. It sounds like a great program. I mean, it really does. Efficient. Uh, it's going to cost us initially about one and three quarter million dollars, right? Yeah, just it'll, just over 1.7 million, yes. Yeah, 1.742. That sounds right. Yeah, 446. So almost a million and three quarters. Uh, not, not, how much are we paying now? I mean, are the systems already paid for, maintenance and so on? It was, when it was purchased 16 years ago, it was a joint purchase with the county. Um, since then, the county has um, 
the, the vendor SunGuard has split it off. There's K-12 that we have, and then there's general government. So it's there's two different right. products now. Right. Um, but this was purchased as a joint purchase through the county 16 years ago. Um, or 15 years, 15 years. I, I remember when we purchased but, um, it. Yeah, so current, this would be a one-time purchase for the licenses. We would host all the data. We own the data. We would host it on our own servers. This is a better route. The other option is to pay software as a service and just pay them annually forever. Um, this is a better return on investment. We analyzed it both ways over a 10-year period, and this gives us a better payback. And, and then, the, and then and the annual have, the annual maintenance cost about one hundred eighty five thousand. Correct. Plus. So th this would be a similar similar to Power School the way it's structured. So okay. would, currently we pay Power School and annual. Would this require less personnel? I mean, could some of our personnel? <coughs> and I agree, Dr. Johnson. They've done an excellent job. Payroll. I mean, all the years I've been involved in Alpha County, they've done a great job. But would some of them be able to be diverted? Is it less? Well, we would certainly be able to eliminate overtime. So we have quite a bit of overtime in our payroll right. department because of the manual processing and the amount of work they have to would do. Would we need as many people um, to run this system? Uh, I don't know if we would need as many, but I wouldn't say we would eliminate uh, people. I think we could divert people to more proactive tasks than yeah. Well, that, than that, and that's exact. That's an excellent way of phrasing what I said. I didn't say get rid of. I just right. said divert. Yeah, yeah, divert to off right. Divert. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Okay. And, um, okay. Whether that's uh, having more, aerob you know, things like. Um, Dealing, dealing with the state with TCRS in a more proactive way than being reactive. And, and th there's lots of things we can do in a more proactive manner than we do currently. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anything else on business there? <laughs> All right. So let's go down to uh, under item E there. We, we will have one policy uh, for second and final reading, the lead testing. Any questions or discussion about that policy? Okay, that brings us to uh, administrative business matters. Um, and, and we've got uh, one item there, the deed transfer, uh, Mowbray Mountain Fire Hall. Mr. Smith. Uh, they, uh, I, I, I recognize that, you know, they have a big need for a, for a, uh, a new fire hall up there on the mountain. I, I get it. I've got a lot of good friends that live up there. The, my only question would be, is I understand this is going back to the county. So we're giving that property back to the county. Uh, I, I would just, I, you know, I know y'all get tired of hearing me cry about this. But one of these days, I'm going to quit crying. I'm going to pitch me a fit. Is I want them buses moved, and so why why could we not work some kind of trade? We, county, we'll give you this piece of property, but you give us that piece of property. I mean, uh, yeah. So we approached them about it. Uh, yeah, we did. We, we this is a this is a, a, a legal trade uh, would have been a legal trade. So we would have stayed with the French. We we did talk to uh, Mark Option. I had several conversations. Um, just about and through, through Justin as well, a couple of conversations about is there any property um, that will be available. The biggest limitation with the bus depot, I won't say limitation, is location. Um, and so in, in 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 conversations with the drivers and and with David and Brandon, um, the location is the key element. And so, are there properties that are outside of the footprint of of where would be um, the the appropriate point um, or, or furthest point? Point that we could have a bus from there are uh, properties, but none that fall within that footprint. And so um, we do have a lead on a couple of properties that are outside of county conversation that are strong leads. Uh, and um, Justin and Brandon and uh, and David visited on Friday. And so um, I feel pretty good about one of them in particular and are working through some additional information. But, but that, that is properties that obviously we'll have to pay for. Correct. We're going to have to buy. Correct. So, so why couldn't we sell this property to the county and then use the proceeds from that sale to buy property to park my buses? 
it probably wasn't sold to us initially. So therefore, in order to make a sell back would be like not probably I, I, a negotiational thing. I think it's one reason. I think the other reason is ultimately, um, you know, we're going to we are going to need schools built. Uh, then we try to have a good relation. We, we are we are working on uh, literally. Uh, we are working on Justin. With, Justin would not talk today about. Um, the property in, in particular that he thinks has has some um, some strong opportunity. So I'm, I'm still from Missouri. <laughs> I'll meet you down there and I can show you where that, that do property. You, do is. you really want the buses in District Three, yeah. or do you want them somewhere else? The, the, I, I don't mind. You don't care. They have to be. They have to be in District Three. They just okay. need to. I mean, yeah. it's just not fair. Uh, to okay. Be on their property and. And Hickson High School needs that space. Yeah. Now, let me be clear. We have buses on other properties in the district, so it's not necessarily. I think the big driver at Hickson is they've got some plans to do yeah. some things in their ag programming, and we never want to limit programming. But East Hamilton has buses that are parked, mm -hmm. um, you know, that are okay. in parking. So we have other schools that, that house and, and, and host buses. I, when I was a principal in Clarksville, I had buses um, on, the, on the property. But we didn't have a program that we were trying to develop. You know mm -hmm. that that would impact yeah. it out of the way. So we're trying to be sensitive with that. But um, ab absolutely, the, the, one of the limitations in there as well is um, in the in the in the first student contract. Because some of those routes are first student, and it's the same as and any of the contract drivers that a few that may use it. Um, it is the pickup point and the distance to the point, and when you expand that distance beyond that radius, you that add vision. dollars to right. what you have to pay. So there, there are just a lot of tentacles. We had two or three leads on properties that we thought might work, and we literally on one of the sites brought the buses in, and um, we were there when we brought the buses in. We just couldn't get off the street in a safe way, and so those properties didn't. That, that particular property didn't work. Um, it's another property that we had a lead on from um, from the mayor. We went to the site to see it. It was um, backed up too close to a community, and just was going to create another uh, firestorm of issues. So it's been a uh, it's been a uh, it's been ongoing. I think we need to have a charrette at our um, retreat about this topic specifically so that we can put a solution in place for Mr. Smith once and for all. I'm joking. I think we have bigger problems, but <laughs> but I am thinking and praying about this every day for you. So, <laughs> Dr. Highlander. Uh, I'm not sure if this is right place, Chairman Wingate, I've got administrative business matters. We've dealt with lead testing, which is state mandate, correct, Dr. Johnson? Correct. Uh, there is a movement in the legislature, you're probably aware, that to do radon testing also. Uh, and our safety manager, I think, has gone through radon training. And so, Tim Harper. Yes. Yep. He's gone through the radon training. But, you know, I, I just like to emphasize that we need to get ahead in this game. Lead testing is bad. I, I mean, lead in the water is bad. Radon is deadly for children and students. I mean, it's, it's very cheap to test a school. Very cheap. Now, if we have to fix it, it's expensive. But if we have to fix it, it's going to be giving people cancer. So, I, I mean, I would really like to see us get on the ball and do some radon testing. We could even do it through the through the science kids in the schools, Hickson High School, Say Daisy, Central, Brown, East Hamilton. But at any rate, thank you. I think we've got a couple of safety type of tests that we're engaged in right now. Uh, Radon, we'll definitely we're definitely working towards it. Um, obviously, the EPA, uh, we just. Um, um, gets entered into that uh, that south side area, uh, and so there's two different things. You have, you, you know, when you start talking about lead, you have the you have the soil um, and groundwater, and then obviously this is the you know, the water uh, that we're testing, and so both of those will be complex. And uh, Justin and I've talked about plans for radon as well. So all those things are in are in motion and in rotation uh, that we'll uh, continue to work through um, as we as we go forward. We anticipate that there'll be some things that we'll have to address, you know, preparing for the worst. Um, hopefully nothing, you know, oh, there. Yeah, great. but, um, yeah. you know, anticipating the worst and, uh, and responding accordingly. So absolutely. Mrs. Robinson. Yeah. I, I thought that I read that the state was, um, 
it's going to provide some type of help around this topic um, to school systems. Am I am I incorrect on that? Mm -hmm. It is currently before the legislator. Okay. I think okay. that's the radon uh, issues because we when we met with class Saturday, this came up. Okay. Thanks. Mrs. Thurman, did you have something? Uh, yes, just a couple of things that were a lot of administrative <laughs> matters. Uh, one thing, uh, this last half day uh, that the students had off has caused a lot of angst for a lot of parents that didn't see it coming, uh, somewhere got lost in the shuffle. Uh, this is what we do with our calendar in October and November has always been insane to me. Uh, and I know we've already approved the calendar for another year. But we do not ever need to have another half day when we're just getting ready to take up, when we've just got back off a of fall break. And then we're getting ready to be off again for uh, Thanksgiving break and have a half day right in the middle. That caused so many problems. Like I say, it got lost with a lot of parents. They didn't, you know, maybe they didn't see it coming. Or they weren't really aware of it. Um, and it, it really caused a, a, a lot of problems. And we really need to work on that. And it may also from a couple of principals contacted said, you know, I don't know what you people think. This uh, this half day, we just might as well not even come to school. It's insane. Uh, so uh, that's, that's one thing um, that we need to, to look at. <clears throat> and uh, also I'd like an update on where we are for the Teach for America. Uh, we've got the, the teachers there, how many that we've gotten and uh, how many we're still short uh, that. And also, uh, Dr. Johnson, I want the, uh, the enrollment numbers I've asked for, and I want the warm body enrollment numbers, by the way, uh, the students who are absolutely uh, butt in seats. Uh, the uh, for, uh, broken down by grade and by uh, race and, and all of that in, in our different schools. Uh, that kind of information is important. We've always gotten it before without even having to ask for it, and I don't know why we have to ask for it now. But uh, the 20-day enrollment figures still haven't gotten them. Uh, I've asked for them numerous times. Uh, but now we're how many days in? I'm not sure how many days in we are now, but we're way past 20. Uh, but anyway, I'd like to, to have that if uh, you don't mind. And also, uh, the flow chart, I did have some commissioners ask me for the flow chart with salaries and all support staff. And I know that we have to have one of those somewhere. Uh, so uh, I would like that as well. And I think I'd like for the uh, to give it to uh, uh, some commissioners uh, who've requested it. And uh, I know we're having a meeting with them in what, a couple of weeks? December the 9th. And uh, so I'd like to have it by then. Thank you. Mrs. Robinson. Um, yeah, I just I just wanted to comment on. Um, well, actually, I want to make a comment for, of what Ron has said, and then I have another. Uh, I'd like an update on something too. But um, I, I, you know, whenever we went over the calendar, I said this multiple times, and I also heard a lot of feedback from parents too with these half days this year. But Wednesday is just not a good day for working parents, and I'm sorry, it's hard for me to, um, you know, get past that because. I know what it's like, but then, I mean, I know that a lot of other people do too, but I heard so many complaints from parents with this past half day, um, with it being on a Wednesday. So, you know, I'd like for us to look at that whenever the time comes. Um, but more importantly, uh, I'd like an update if it's possible on the, um, security officer, the chief security officer, um, coming back from the TSBA convention, you know, we sat through a session on school safety. We looked at a number of school safety um, product vendors. And so I'm just curious where we are with that. Yeah, it's been posted. Uh, it's been taken down. We've got applicants and we've got a target interview date set um, with the hopes of having it done by um, um, by the time we leave for Thanksgiving break, ideally. Uh, and so I think there's six or seven um, really qualified candidates um, that Angela and Keith have gone through uh, that all have experience in the area. And so um, we're hoping to expedite that and get it done. Um, just a point of, uh, so absolutely, we're, we're, we feel the urgency to, to get that position filled um, and, and we'll do so. Um, 
We'll absolutely look at the half day. Um, I think, you know, obviously this was the first year of doing it. I want to be abundantly clear that we did it based on teacher feedback and teacher recommendation and brought that to the board um, collectively and, 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 and went through and looked at um, the, you know, the, the days we can absolutely adjust it. I think, you know, it's the, it's the first year of it and we even had some internal things we had to work to address the principles on, you know, how do you leverage and use it the most. The thing I still consistently hear from teachers is that they don't don't have enough time and so this was an initial effort to make sure um, that we give them some more time but I think obviously you know thinking through the win and the placement of it we tried to what we tried to do was to to balance it around the benchmark so that they had the results back and could actually hopefully use those in a in a thoughtful way but I, I definitely hear folks on October as a parent of a second grader myself um, that had it on a Wednesday yeah. uh, we have you know we have to figure it out and uh, it, it it's not it's not easy so we understand that um, I do know and Ryan, I'll go back and look I do know at least I, I'm pretty sure the 15 day enrollment that we had sent broken down by race and I may have missed the 20 day but we'll absolutely get that broken down to you by race um, I think we had the 10 day I'm not sure we had the 15 I think I'm not sure I think I know we had the 10 but uh, a lot of things change at that point uh, but about the calendar we're off on Wednesday Thursday Friday what Thanksgiving correct Wednesday Thursday correct. Friday why not just take the Monday and Tuesday off and give them the whole week if you're going to do that and like if, instead of giving these half days I think that's something we ne might need to look at I mean um, that's what most private schools do uh, that to give them the whole week off if we're going to just take a half day here and a half day there instead of just burning up all these. Uh, I mean, because it's, it's very hard for parents. Uh, you know, my daughter just happens to have, like you say, we have a pop and a, a nana that can help out a little bit, but everybody don't have a pop and a nana to help out. Uh, you have to pay for daycare, you know, and all, and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, uh, and, you know, we need to worry about parent feedback as, as well as teacher Absolutely. feedback. We shouldn't just always... You know, because you know, as the teachers, you want half a day out. Yeah, whatever. But, you know, we need to also worry about the parents as they, they pay the bills. Absolutely. As, as, um, and I'll just reiterate, uh, I'm a superintendent, but I'm a husband and father first. So as the father that had to go to Subway to get my son the foot loan and, and <laughs> pay for the aftercare for the half day, uh, I feel firsthand uh, the challenge that it creates on uh, on parents. And, um, and know that that time um, is tough to be regardless. Um, so absolutely. Mrs. Lennon. Um. Thank you, Tiffany, for bringing up the security, <coughs> student security officer. I was going to ask for an update about that myself because that what the um, it was brought to our attention again at the uh, leadership conference. We had such a powerful presentation um, about security, um, taking the lead to create safe schools, and I think we have got to take advantage of the opportunity right now to create safe schools, and I don't think that we are doing it across our district um, in a mindful manner, so I'd really like to you know, get an update and see that that happens. Um, it was very, very good, uh, and I'd like to share it with the, the presentation that we have with all of our schools. It was that, I thought it was that powerful, and I think that everybody that was there and listened to it thought it agreed. Um, the other thing about the half day, too, is I do think that our teachers need a half day of planning every, uh, you know, I know a lot of school systems that do it. it we talked about it at the um, uh, leadership conference. There was a lot of school systems that do have it built in, and they do it w weekly. I mean, that there's a half day. Um, there's some school systems that do it. It's just automatically either a Wednesday or a Friday. I think it's change is hard, and so we're not used to it here in Hamilton County. I think that there is a disconnect with there's a you know it's hard because we're not used to it, um, but it's important I think for our teachers to get that planning. I think that it was there. I would like to see that it's definitely for planning. I think there are some times that um, it, some teachers were upset because there was it was used for professional development and they didn't get their planning. So I would like to make sure that it's used for teacher planning and not professional development because we did as a board vote for um, that it was going to be used for teacher planning and I did hear that some principals... 
you know, there were seven schools that I think um, uh, misunderstood uh, the direction. We um, have clarified that. We called it the night before. Um, have clarified that with schools to make sure they understand the importance of maximizing that that planning time. Um, to be abundantly clear, having been a principal, having been a teacher in the classroom, there are times as a principal we believe in defined autonomy for schools. Um, I firmly believe in supporting teachers. Um, I do trust our school leaders. Um, as a school leader, I, I would want the ability um, and not I would hope that the school board and the administration would trust me as a school leader to understand what my building may need. So there may be a, a, a 30 or 45 minute requirement where I need to say I need to bring my school together. Let's reset. We've got three or four hours here that, hey, I'm going to give you plenty of planning time. Let's have some conversation about thing X so that we're all the same shit of music. But we we have given clear direction to schools um, around the expectation for planning and to maximize planning time going forward. So we, we heard that feedback and jumped all over it as well um, and, and know that it's something again as it's new um, we probably be better this third time and then obviously going forward we'll look at adjusting it um, but that that's what I just wanted to re, uh, thank Tiffany for bringing that up because we did have a lot of good discussion about that at the leadership conference thank you since you mentioned safety could I ask real quickly how are we standing on our I know we were nine resource officers short and and then four that are on leave 13 how are we standing on that now dr johnson or, or keith i'm not sure i know that's a lot to do with the sheriff more than with us yeah i don't i don't know that we're any better i sent um captain shepter captain shepherd an email um uh, early this morning uh and asking for an update based on what i had i hadn't heard from him yet um i will call him again uh, just because i want to get another uh update on uh, exactly where we are um and so we're still kind of in the same uh, position as far as we know uh, with uh, with struggling to do that. It, and just to be clear, this <clears throat> both of these uh, mechanisms that we tried to put in place around safety were approved last month. And so, you know, it's not it's been, you know, less than 30 days, you know, since we um, did the two thousand dollar bonus, <clears throat> as well as the approval of the security um, the officer position. Um, and so, you know, we, we would anticipate some traction, uh, hopefully with those. Again, we've gotten uh, really strong applicants on the security um, officer role and, and the district has done some things. You all as a board have done several things. The impetus behind that that development of that role was to become better and so um, you know we think there's definitely some opportunity to become better um, for students and in light of the tragedy that transpired just this past week um, we have to continue to head in that direction I think as a system and so um, th we continue to struggle <laughs> I will say, I've got a young cousin on the city police force, and he said both the city of Chattanooga and Hamilton County are struggling to maintain their quotas and get, get their up to what they're qualified financially for. So it's not that we, we, I would like for the public to know that we are not remiss in this. We just don't have the availability of them right now. Is that correct yet? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely correct. So, so we, I mean, we are we are wanting them, and we have uh, uh, guaranteed the funding for them. But but we've got to get them people willing to take the job. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'll just say a couple of things uh, quickly before I'm going to uh, recognize uh, Mr. McClendon. Uh, as far as the calendar goes, um, I'm, I'm sure I'm certain we've got some work to do as far as making sure we consider parents and and uh, and teachers, all stakeholders. Um, but from being involved with this for a long time, um, you're never going you're never going to have a calendar that's going to it's going to make people happy. Um, it's just the way that it is. And, and two, uh, I'll, I'll speak for myself, but there'll never be a time uh, while I'm associated uh, with this, either this board or this school system, that I care any at all one iota what a private school's doing. I care less about what private schools are doing. That's, that, they don't live in the same universe we live in. So they can take a week off. They can take 10 days off. They can do whatever they want to. It, it, it doesn't matter. Um, Mr. McClendon. Going off the uh, conversation about safety, I've asked uh, Chairman Wingate to add to the agenda um, an action uh, item uh, asking Dr. Johnson and his uh, staff to, to send out an RFP uh, to look at what uh, bringing security officers of some type onto our schools would look like. Um, to echo what Kathy said, um, 
and what numerous uh, members of the board saw and heard at presentations at our conference this past weekend, um, it, it became very clear to me uh, that we aren't doing um, enough uh, to, to keep our schools safe, to be um, preventative measures. Um, he, the, the guy, uh, went into, I thought was a great analogy, um, looking at, at a school like an onion. You want as many layers of security for that school as possible. Um, and, and right now, uh, not going into detail, but think about the schools you go into every day and what's the only thing keeping someone bad from, from our schools that don't have SROs. Um, there, there's not much. Um, and so this does nothing but, the, but to give um, Dr. Johnson and his uh, staff the ability to go out and look at RFPs um, or, or to send out an RFP and let uh, you know private companies um, or whoever uh, responds to the RFP um, look at, at, at some kind of security measure uh, officer um, to make sure that we are uh, doing everything in our power as a board uh, to keep our school safe every single day. Yes, Joe, I thought that was very uncalled for. I was just, a, they're more in tune to their customers than we are our customers is the only thing in, well, in well, a sure private they, school. Sure they are. Uh, yeah, yeah, they sure are. Sure they are. I mean, when you and pay $24,000 a year, you, you're going to be exa in tune. You're exactly right. And parents, right. Pay, parents pay money to us. That's why we're all here. If they didn't pay us money, none of us would be here. Nobody. Uh, Dr. Johnson wouldn't have a salary. None of us would be here. Nobody. But private, school, have, private schools have nothing to do with this. No. They got zero I'm just to do saying, with this. It's Joe, I'm just saying that they're in tune. And let me tell you something. A lot of people that go to our school have kids in private school as well. And I was sure. just oh, I, I was just making, and, and that's the reason a lot of them will put, will to put their other kid now in private school because it's a, it's a hardship on them. I'm not saying we should do anything they do. I'm just saying they're in tune to that. And it does make more sense if we're going to have a half a day off here and a half a day off there, maybe put them all together. Absolutely. I really, yeah. and like I said, I vote against the calendar every year because we do crazy stuff like this because we really don't care what anybody thinks. And, and uh, you know, and that, that's always been bothersome to me. We don't care what single moms think. We don't care what, you know, all we care about is what the teachers union want and what the teachers want. And I'm saying we need to be more in tune with our customers. Now, like I say, I don't care really. My daughter went to private school, and there are a lot of, lot of the people that, that had kids in private school. They had kids in public school as well. It, you know, And then they, they, it was a hardship for them to kind of do for one and not the other. They put both of them in private school. Okay, fine. That's fine. I'm just saying a lot of people do that. If it doesn't bother you, it doesn't bother me. Because uh, right now, you know, my, my grandkids are in, in public school, and, and we'll deal with it. But I'm just saying, let's make it a little bit easier on our customers. They are our customers, and we continually forget that, that they are our customers. And I wasn't, I don't, I don't appreciate the snide remark about public schools, because you know those people in private schools, they pay money to, for this school system as well. Now, that, that's fine, but the, the reality around being out for a full week for Thanksgiving got nothing to do with anything but having border students who get on a plane and go home. That's what that's about. That's about giving them an extra day. No, it ain't whatever. That's what it is. So we we all I'm saying is I'm tired of people involved in the school system who have kids in private school telling the public school system what it all look like. Well, you know what? That, that, that's, you know, that's the way it is. There's people in the administration there because a bunch of people in this administration have their kids. No doubt. No doubt. Oh, no me? doubt. I'm talking to anybody and everybody. I'm talking to you. Know what I'm saying? A say in what? Listen, we better be glad there's private schools in this town because if the 30% of the people in this county who have kids in private school and homeschool show up at their homeschool here to, uh, tomorrow, we're going to have a problem. Because they're going to have to send their kids to private school and they're going to have to send their kids to private school tomorrow. We could not educate them. No doubt, and that's and that and that's a reflection of poor leadership over the last two decades. Thank God. There's no doubt about that. Thank God. All right, so, uh, Mr. Uh, McClendon, what do we need to do with um, what you brought forward? I, I, I think you just have to put it on the agenda. All right. So are you making yeah. a request for that? Yeah. So we need another board member to second that. Second. It's not a motion. It's just a Right. I'm just saying okay. we've got two board members that want to have it on the agenda. Okay. okay. So we'll add it to the agenda for Thursday night. All right. Anything else that you'd see there? Um, we got a letter from the county about recognition of the school board on December 3rd at the Christmas um, Christmas at the courthouse. 
and it's good, our time is going to be Tuesday. It's not on your um, events because it's just going in. So I just want to bring that to your attention. If you wouldn't, I'll send an email, but I just need to know if you're going to go because they want to be able to recognize those people who are there. Can you tell us the time again? I don't have that. It may be in your letter. I didn't get a letter, so I don't know if it's in your letter. It should be at your spot there. It's in the letter. Yeah. If, if, it's, if it's not, I will find out and get with you. Spe speaking, okay. speaking of invitations, so uh, I, I hear meeting, uh, mention of a meeting with the county commission. I've yet to be invited to any meeting with the county commission or, or be, so I'm, I'm interested to know how some of you guys know about that. It was the media. That's only the media. Yeah. He announced it at the commission meeting. Yeah. Well, announcing to the media and being on Facebook doesn't doesn't I get agree. me there. So. Yeah. I think I think Blaine, on December the ninth. Um, the it's the same it's during our agenda session. It's the same day as the agenda session. Um, at uh, six thirty. Um, six o'clock. Maybe six. I think it's six. Um, so we're having our agenda session at five, and then our meeting with the commission at six. Are we having the we're agenda session at Red Mike Middle? We'll just do it all um, over there. there. Yeah. He did oh, check with you ahead of time before he did this. Yeah, right? we we had some conversation. The mayor and I did, and I think uh, I necessarily anticipated going out to the meeting, but it, it was out there. I, I put in the board update that we were looking at a date uh, for um, a, a, I'll say a joint meeting, but a well a joint meeting. We were thinking of the topic of student success planning. If you will look back in the board update um, prior to the announcement and then when he landed we landed on a date when he you know we kind of went back and forth and kind of looked at this date and look at that date and and then obviously it was announced at the county commission and so um, that is the date and um, it'll be six o'clock is someone building a, an agenda for this meeting and if so who is it yeah, so he and I are supposed to talk, okay. um, and it, we're meeting in the next week or so, and, and there will obviously be more information on the agenda around. If I can speak candidly, time. I would just like to have some type of opportunity to either see the agenda ahead of time or Absolutely. some type of say in the agenda, only because we've had multiple meetings with the commission that, um, you know, have gone fine, but at the end of the day, didn't feel like they produced any any real results. And I think that if we can really understand what we're going to this meeting to accomplish, I think that everyone at the at the end will feel like they at least, you know, understood what they're going there for and hopefully will feel like there's some type of productivity. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we have anything else? Meeting adjourned.